So hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, like Bethany said, I'm the curator here at Strawberry Bank, although I think I know most of you. So thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to be sharing some objects of mourning from the museum collection. But I wanted to start with acknowledging that while these objects were created um, because somebody died, really, I like to think of them as being something um, of celebration, not just of sadness and death. And the term memento mori that is so associated with um, objects of mourning is literally translates to remember you must die. Um, and that really, again, is not necessarily meant to be sad. It's just meant to acknowledge that it's a reminder to be joyful in life um, because we all have an inevitable end. So there are two major events that happened in England um, that precipitate, precipitated um, what we know of as mourning here in America. And the first is the death of George the I, I mean, I'm sorry, Charles the I, who was executed by the English government. Um, and though he wasn't very popular in life, he became very popular in death. And <clears throat> these little objects were made and worn by um, his past subjects, or the subjects that were still alive, I should say. Um, and they were worn in hiding until the ascension, ascension of his brother Charles II in 1660. And of course, the greatest mourner of all, Queen Victoria, who mourned her husband for 40 years. Um, Prince Albert died in 1861, and she continued to mourn him until her own death in 1901. Um, some memorable memorials to him are the Victorian Albert Museum, the Royal Albert Hall, and of course the Frogmore Estate where the two are buried. And the, the period of mourning in the Victorian era um, is familiar to us as Americans for sure, and um, created all different ways of um, memorializing people, including hair memorials, post-mortem photography, which I chose not to include, um, but you could easily find images on the internet if you so choose. And of course, various, um, extensions and phases of mourning. Victoria chose to remain in black for literally the rest of her life, but some of her children eventually wore purple or the young ones even white. But of course, um, the reason for us getting together today is to look at our own collection. Some of you might recognize this as the portal to the Strawberry Bank collection, where you can go to our website um, and search the collection um, for items you might be interested in learning about. And we're going to begin Strawberry Bank's collection with acknowledging George Washington's memorial. He died in 1799, and upon his death, really, America mourned this president. And um, you can see I've written here rings, needlework, medals, ceramics, um, handkerchiefs were all created in his image um, and with pieces of his hair, pieces of Martha's hair, and hundreds and hundreds of objects were created and dozens and dozens of museums still have them um, in their collection. And we still memorialize Washington every year. Um, we call it President's Day, but um, President's Day is in fact Washington's birthday. This is actually Alex, this photograph. Thank you, Alex. Um, this is Strawberry Banks Washington Memorial. It includes the hair of both George and Martha. And it was worked by a young woman named Mary Lear Storer, who was the niece of Tobias Lear. And many of you might know that Tobias Lear was Washington's personal secretary for many years, was at his side when um, the president died and lived here, grew up here in Portsmouth. And so Washington visited Mrs. Lear and Ms. Storer um, in 1789 when he did his Northern tour. And we know that Martha herself sent um, Mrs. Lear at that time, uh, both pieces of her own hair and of Washington's hair. And you can see in this letter here, I was much pleasure sending to you the hair you so ob obligingly desired. And this is what it actually says. This is worked with our illustrious and beloved George Washington's hair, which covered his exalted head but now enrolled among the dead, yet where is a crown above the fires and realms of bills which never dies? This is worked with Lady Martha Washington's hair, relict of our beloved general. 
I pray her honored head may long survive the dead. And when she doth her breath resign, may she in heaven her concert join. So you can see there's kind of two sections to this memorial. The first bit being washing George's hair, and the second bit being um, Lady Washington or just Martha Washington's hair. Um, and it, at the very bottom, Ms. Storr has in included that this hair was sent to Mrs. Lear by her good friend, Lady Washington. Now this is a mourning ring. This ring was created in 1786 to commemorate, I'm gonna butcher this poor man's name, Misach Ware. Um, and this is a pretty familiar um, style, a gold band with black enamel. The um, deceased's uh, name and dates. And in this particular ring, we have a little raised coffin that um, there's a skeleton sketched on a piece of paper, which has in, in, been encased in crystal. And the skeleton, of course, is a memento mori, um, meaning remember we must die. Um, so the wearer of this ring gets to remember her or his loved one um, while also remembering that they too must die. And so therefore to celebrate life. This again is not meant to be um, just about grief and sadness, but also celebration. And here is a detail of that ring. It's quite an extraordinary um, piece in our collection uh, based on its age, based on its um, connection to the state of New Hampshire. And it was purchased for us by our friend and neighbor, Hollis Broderick. Now Ware uh, was, is known as the father of New Hampshire. He was very involved in the revolution. Although I've been doing some reading about him and I don't think that came by him naturally. I think he wanted to be a farmer and lead a quiet life, but he was really compelled into this life of service. He drafted the state constitution and he was the chairman on the committee of safety all throughout the revolution. And due to that tremendous impact, there are memorials to him all over the state, including the town of Ware, Ware, New Hampshire, which of course you have to say Ware. It's the rule when anyone discusses the city of Ware, town of Ware. Um, and then this memorial to him in his hometown of Hampton Falls. This is another mourning ring. Um, I'm looking for her dates. Um, this ring we actually purchased as part of the Sawtell collection um, when those items went up for sale. And it is on display in the Maritime Gallery. It's one of the only mourning objects that we actually have on display. And this ring was made in memory of Elizabeth Hickey, who was the daughter of a Captain James Hickey. And of course, I can really only tell you his story because she died um, as, a, as a child at age 14. Um, Captain Hickey was a naval officer in the British Navy, and he really never severed his ties to the British government. And of course, when the uh, American Revolution came along, that wasn't really acceptable. And he was um, arrested by the Committee of Safety and stayed and was taken to Exeter um, for some amount of time. They didn't leave Portsmouth in the end. And Elizabeth died in 1783, and she's buried at St. John's. And this ring, again, like Mr. Ware's, is gold with black enamel, her name and her dates. But this isn't a bit earlier um, in style. This is a, you can think of it as Georgian or Rococo, the scrolled um, gold band. I did, I did note that this ring is very large. I, I purchased this ring myself, so I'm quite familiar with it. And it certainly wouldn't fit on any of my fingers. And it makes me think that it was made for a man because of its size. And perhaps James, Captain James Hickey himself wore this ring in honor of his daughter. And another thing to note is that rings like this um, and even Mr. Ware's ring were made um, sort of by the set. So a mourner, a father, a mother could purchase 10 or a dozen of these rings have them made, you know, out of blanks that the jeweler would just have. This is a very, very um, common style, this particular Rococo band. And they could be given out to close um, family or friends at the loved one's memorial service. This is Ms. Hickey's gravestone at St. John's that you can still drive by if you walk by. She's one of the ones closest to um, Chapel Street, so you can see her fairly easily. And I was, I was interested to learn that the text on her gravestone 
was used by Evan Chambers to create a song called the Old Burial Burying Ground, which St. John's is certainly an old burying ground. And it was recorded by the University of Michigan's Symphony Orchestra. And you can read what it says um, on her gravestone. Relentless death, why pluck the tender bud ere nature quite has opened to its prime, the lovely maid. Spectators see the lot of all, be wise in time, eternity is near. Which is sort of um, echoing, remember, we must die. This is, a this is a memorial to Jeremiah Hill, who some of you might know um, built the Wendell House. Uh, this is silk, this is a piece of silk that has been painted. And now we're sort of creeping into the more uh, Regency or federal period. And the symbols of mourning that we see here, um, you, you'll see on mourning pieces throughout this period. The weeping willow tree, the grieving will, wi widow with her uh, head to her hand and sort of bending over the tomb, the urn, which I don't, it, it, people weren't really being uh, cremated then. So, you know, an urn is just a symbol from the federal period. It was pleasing to the eye. And it's certainly been incorporated into pieces of mourning. Um, and of course, Mrs. Hill is wearing her black dress. And this object was a gift from Ron Bourgeau. And this came out of basically um, doing the Wendell exhibit last year, the year, whenever we did the Wendell exhibit, what is time? Um, so this is Mr. Hill's uh, memorial. And here's a close up where you can see all of those federal symbols pretty well. And she must have liked him because she really is grieving. She's got a handkerchief and everything. And his death must have been, well, it is, it's sudden. So on his tombstone, which you can visit uh, at the North Cemetery, um, his tombstone echoes the weeping willow, the urn, and it says, sacred to the memory of Jeremiah Hill Esquire, who by a sudden death was summoned to the world of spirits in 1800 when he was 48 years old. And at the very, very bottom, it says, surviving friends, the solemns summons here, prepare to follow him in life so dear. So again, that memento mori, remember we almost die. This pendant locket was made for Lydia Chapley who was married to Reuben Shapley, who you may know of at least. And again, it has the familiar um, weeping willow and the urn and the grieving um, loved ones. This isn't documented anywhere, but I believe these grievers to be um, Reuben Shapley himself and then their daughter, Nancy, um, again, with the posture of the hand to the head leaning over the um, epitaph to their loved one. And in this locket, um, we have the federal imagery, the Regency imagery, but, and if you turn the locket over, you can see that there has been some of Nancy's, or sorry, Lydia's hair encapsulated into um, the locket itself. So you could wear this as a pendant, as a necklace, or even make it into a brooch. And you could have the imagery um, of yourself, basically, you're creating a morning um, item for yourself to wear, um, but then take a little piece of Lydia with you as her hair is in the back. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Nancy died two years after her mother, still as a young woman, she never married, she never left the family home, and she joined uh, her mom, Lydia, in the family tomb, which is also at St. John's Churchyard. And just an aside, because the name Reuben Shapley is so familiar to us all, as Strawberry Bank owns the Reuben Shapley house, um, Shapley, which I just assumed lived in this house with his family, actually built it as an investment property in 1816, which I thought was interesting because obviously that's just three years after that great fire of 1813 that came up to basically where they built this house. But it remains, so I guess they did okay. Um, here's a Habs photo, the black and white, and of course, what it looks like today. And then we get into the Victorian period. Um, when we get into the, when we leave the federal period within the Strawberry Bank collection, we start to lose the stories that go with the objects. But I still wanted to show some to you. Um, 
the Victorians, they did wear, although their mourning was more severe than really any other period um, within this Anglo-American time period that I'm focused on, um, but they did allow themselves to wear some jewelry. So here are two pieces that are made of French jet, which is basically glass, it's shiny glass. Um, one is just a simple uh, cross. You can see that we've left David Murray photography and these are my own iPhone photographs. So the detail is not quite as clear. Um, but then we have this brooch, which also has, still has the French jet, but also um, has enclosed some of a loved one's hair. These are also pieces from our collection that are made with materials that were common and popular uh, during the Victorian period. There's Whitby jet, um, which is much more dull and it's a fossilized wood. There's bog oak, which is um, also a fossilized wood. And there's onyx. And then other um, items that I couldn't identify having been in our collection, vulcanite, which is a hard rubber and gutta percha, which is a softer, more um, soft rubber like resin. Now this is a book of patterns because of course, um, you know, if you think about mourning jewelry, perhaps your first out of the federal period, perhaps the thing that you, you focus on first is hair, <laughs> hair jewelry. And the market was so strong that all these pattern books were created. And you can see how um, deceased or loved ones, they could still be living, I suppose, hair has been braided, um, made into netting, swerped, twisted, uh, every which way to create objects. And this is the Strawberry Bank collection of hair objects. And if you see um, connected to the objects are their accession tags. And if you see a bunch of 1975s and a lot of 1974s, unfortunately that means we do have the object, but we don't know much about it. Um, in the early mid seventies, uh, Strawberry Bank went through a massive accessioning project. And most of the items that were accessioned during that time didn't come with a history. So we have them ex as examples of how American Victorians were mourning, but we don't have any personal stories to go along with them. But you can see um, many sets of earrings, brooches, both um, in metal and just hair. There's necklaces, there's bracelets, any kind of jewel, make it out of hair. And I did notice when I was doing some research into this, how there is still a market and if times continue to be tough and we don't know anything about those objects, perhaps we could, you know, have a little income. But I'm just kidding, we would never do that. And while this is not in the Strawberry Bank collection, this is from the Presque Isle Historical Society. Um, I just wanted to show you an, an, exam an elaborate example of what one can do with your loved one's hair. Uh, this Portsmouth Historical Society actually has a magnificent hair wreath um, and it's stuck in my brain since I saw it 20 years ago. And I really wanted to share an example because you can see all the different colored hair that is represented on this piece. I mean, that could be generations of a family who um, have been remembered forever. And finally, I wanted to share an object from my own personal collection that's brand new. Um, and so objects of mourning are still being made, still being worn, or at least in collections. And this is a locket that has ashes in it that has been soldered shut. Um, so while mourning in the way that the Victorians or even the Federalists did no longer truly exists, it's still possible to create a memento of your loved one so you can continue to celebrate their life after they're gone. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And we have encountered one of those little challenges um, that we actually come across with technology um, in that while Zoom assures me uh, chat is enabled, um, there isn't actually a chat function at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have a question for Elizabeth, um, what we can do just to make sure we can all get answers um, is either raise your hand in the screen and I will call on you or you can raise your hand um, using the um, uh, using the symbol um, in your in your uh, toolbar. And I see Pam Weeks, do you have a question? Don't forget to unmute yourself. You can just push the space bar to do that.
There we go. Hi, Sam. Hi. I'm curious what the ground fabric is for the Washington Hare Memorial Embroidery. It's a piece of black silk. Really? <laughs> Sorry, we're in the library at work. No, oh, not at all. And are there any other questions? Nancy. I, I don't have a question, but um, since Elizabeth shared something from her family, from her personal collection, I thought I'd share one of mine. I, um, this is kind of hard to see, unfortunately, but this is a family heirloom and we, it's a, how do you pronounce it? Is it daguerreotype, Elizabeth? A dig, a dig, <laughs> you're gonna make you know, me not be able to see it. A daguerreotype. Daguerreotype. So this, oh, there, it's hard because I didn't know exactly who this person was. My, my grandmother gave it to my mother and my mother gave it to me. And I looked online, it is a picture of Governor McNair of Missouri, who is the first governor of Missouri. He is my great, great grandfather. And this is a morning brooch. He died in 1826. And that's beautiful. Yeah, and in the back there's hair. What's the metal? So, can you tell? Well, I, I'm not quite sure it could be brass. Um, I, I'm not quite sure, part, some of it is engraved, but not all of the scroll work is engraved. Um, so sometime Elizabeth, I'll bring it so you can see it. Okay. Um, but the, the, the sad part about it is it's fading. So the, the image is, is growing smaller from the outside in. Yeah, you wanna keep that in a tight, dark box as often as possible. Yeah, I normally do, but it's it's not, it's just in a jewelry box, you know, in um, cotton. I don't yeah. know if it's tight enough, but um, yeah. And I didn't know who it was for a really long time, but I started um, doing some family work and and all of a sudden this picture popped up and I said, oh my goodness, I think that's, that's my great, great grandfather. <laughs> so wow. that was kind of a neat thing to find, um, to find out this year. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is, and, it, really, and it is a battle to keep a daguerreotype from fading. They really yeah. want to fade. Yeah, and I don't know how to keep it from doing that, but um, I will try my best to keep it dark and cold and covered. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for letting me share. And Maddie. So I was wondering, um, you know, with all of our Victorian jewelry, do we have any enamel work um, in our morning collection? No, okay. Not in the morning collection, um, but there are some enameled worked pieces, although hmm. they might be more federal than Victorian. I would wanna go back and look, but not in what I would consider the morning category, unfortunately. Okay. I um, have a family locket with my third or fourth great grandfather in it who died at like age 40 or something. And he, um, his, his photo is in the locket, but it's, it's entirely enameled on the outside with like a lapis lazuli. Um, oh, that sounds beautiful. Beautiful. And I just have never seen anything like it. So I'm always sort of curious, you know, whether it was like more of a regional thing or, but we had- I'd a, love to see a photo. Yeah, yeah. No, we had it assessed, um, I don't know, like 15 years ago. And the jeweler said that it was um, the forget-me-nots. Oh, yeah. In, in, in it, that it was a morning piece and I had, it had never occurred to me because it's so sort of like bright and cheery, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's very- Object of celebration. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Um, 
Pam Weeks, I still you still have a, a hand raised symbol up. Do you have another question? All right, any other questions? Um, Elizabeth, I was wondering, um, you talked, you showed us um, a lot of pictures. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the symbols of mourning um, that we saw in some of these objects. Yeah, well, Maddie actually just named a good one, a forget-me-not in terms of a flower. But what we saw in the federal pieces were the weeping willows, of course, figures in black, black being a good indicator of how someone's feeling. Um, the momentum mori itself, when I, when I say momentum mori, um, there's that phrase associated with it, but it technically is that skull with angel wings that you see often in just plain bands and also on gravestones. Um, and as time progressed, uh, symbols of mourning became like an oak tree signifying strength and of course acorns um, because they grow on oak trees. Um, and reaching way back in Shakespeare, Ophelia says to Hamlet, rosemary is for remembrance and gives him rosemary. And that was, that was meant to um, symbolize mourning or grief because that family was certainly having a bit of a hard time at that moment in that play. Um, and then pomegranates are actually a, a symbol of mourning as well, based on um, that biblical tale about Persephone, um, you know, being let out of hell for many months out of the year, but she had to go back to hell, meaning winter, because she ate one pomegranate seed. And so the devil made her go back to be with him for the <laughs> winter months but don't tell that to the skiers because they like winter. So those are some symbols of mourning. Thank you. Any last questions? All right, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us and to remind you that our next chat will be on Wednesday, February 3rd with Rodney Rowland and that will be from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Bethany.